Any questions about EDA before we move on to the next subject, which is going to be slightly more statistical? So we've got one more module to go in, is it like 45 minutes? So, uh, yeah, okay. But the module tomorrow morning is actually a bit shorter, so we'll probably finish it tomorrow morning. I want to make sure you know we understand it because it's quite important. Okay, so we're now going to talk about one sample and two sample t-tests. So for example, in the gene expression experiment, we want to find the genes that are differentially expressed now, right? So we've normalized, we've looked at everything, uh, everything seems okay, we've taken the log transform. Now we want to know what are the genes that are differentially expressed between uh, the two conditions. <clears throat> so. Probably, so when I did my, um, my PhD in statistics, we had to do uh, consulting, that is, we had to do consulting at the University of Washington in Seattle with people from the whole university, and they would come and they had these statistical problems that would, you know, they would ask you about lots of things, how to do this, how to do that, how can I compute the p-value. And I remember one of the professors that was actually uh, taking care of the consulting lab there said, you know, doing consulting with someone uh, on a statistical problem is basically trying to understand where the t-test is. So it's just to tell you how important the t-test is. Often people are very interested in comparing the, the effect of a drug or the difference between two samples, um, and it's just trying to do a sample t-test. Okay, so often it's trying to write down the problem in a way that uh, you're trying to do a test, and often you're just interested in comparing two conditions, that is trying to look for the t-test. Okay, so what is a t-test? <clears throat> so a t-test can be used to do what we call a one-sample or a two-sample t-test, and it's typically to test the hypothesis about the mean or the means of one or more distributions. So for example, let's say we've got the gene expression data set, and we want to know is the mean expression in the HIV sample different from the mean expression level in the control sample. So typically, when you do a t-test, you have to assume that the data are normal. Though we'll see, and we talk a little bit about that, the t-test is fairly robust, and you can get away with that assumption, assuming you've got enough data points in your sample. OK, so one sample t-test. Let's assume we've got a data set, and we're just going to enumerate the data points as y1 up to yn. For the t-test, we have to assume that the data yeah, are independent, normally distributed, with a mean mu and a variance sigma squared. So what we want to test is, is the mean mu equal to mu naught, some value? And the alternative, that it's not equal to that value. What we're going to do is that we're going to form what's called a test statistic, and in this case, it is the t-statistic. So the t-statistics is written as this ratio. So we're going to compute the sample mean. We're going to subtract the, uh, the null hypothesis, or mu naught. And then we're going to divide by the sample variance, uh, sample standard deviation divided by the square root of n, where n is the sample size. So what does this do? So this is just the distance between the sample mean and the mean you're trying to test. So the idea is that. A large t statistic will be the evidence that probably you should reject your null hypothesis. If you get a t that's very large, it means that probably you should reject the fact that mu is equal to mu naught. If mu, um, if the true mean is very far from mu naught, then the sample mean should be far from that value, right? Because the data are going to tell you that the mean of the data is very different from mu naught. So this will be big. So it makes sense. However, you kind of want to penalize noisy samples. If there's lots of variability in your data point, in your uh, data set, you kind of want to penalize your statistics for it, okay? Because if there's lots of variability, then maybe by chance alone you could get a mean that's very different from mu naught. So you want to penalize uh, the statistics by that. So this is kind of like a penalized version of the difference between the empirical mean and uh, the true mean that you're trying to test the mean that you're trying to test mu naught. So large values of the t statistics are evidence 
then probably we should reject the null hypothesis. <clears throat> if the mean is mu naught, so under the null hypothesis that the data really come from uh, a normal distribution with mean mu naught, then t should follow a t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So it, again, a t distribution I've told you earlier, it's very similar to the normal, but there's that extra parameter which is called the degrees of freedom, which sort of tells you how heavy the tails are. And when n is close to infinity, it's basically a Gaussian distribution. So I'm going to show you a couple of graphics, you'll see that. Any questions about this? So, the, you know, you shouldn't worry too much about the formula because uh, you don't need to know it. You know what? Because R does it for you, and there's a nice interface, a nice function that you can use for that. <clears throat> well, now, how can we relate these guys? So I say, well, if when t is large, we're going to know that we should reject the null hypothesis. But what we'd like to do is to have a PLU that will help us in making the decision. So basically, we're going to try to <coughs> compute the p-value, which will be computed like that. So um, maybe we'll move on to, so basically, what we're going to compute is what is the probability that we observe a statistics as extreme or more extreme than the one that we computed from our data set. And I'll explain you why you compute it like that. Let's look at the graphs. I think I have a graph after. OK. <clears throat> so this is one of the genes from, um, so this is gene one from the HIV data set. So what we want to know, so we can compute the log ratio. The gene is going to be differentially expressed if the log ratio is very different from, from zero. If the log ratio is close to zero, it means that there's no difference between the, the two samples, right? So what we'd like to know is, is the, the, X, the log ratio for gene one uh, equal to zero, or is it different from zero, right? To know if the gene is differentially expressed. Does that make sense? OK. Log Yes. Okay. So remember that we've taken the log of of uh, the expression data set on the log scale. What we want to know is is there a difference between treatment and control? So it's basically saying is the log ratio or the log difference between the two different? If there's no difference, it means that the gene is not differentially expressed. If there's a difference, it means the gene is differentially expressed. Sorry, in the previous formula, the difference between the two means what term is? Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> let me go back to the formula. So here, this will be, so y will be the log ratios. So what we would do is that we're just going to compute all of the log ratios. Here we've got a cDNA microarray. So we've got a pairing between the control and the treatment. So we can summarize the data set into the log ratio for each replicate, okay, which will be just the the difference between the treatment and the control for that gene for replicate one, replicate two, replicate three, replicate four. And this will be the y's. Is that clear? I know it's late, but if you know if you've got questions, if it's not clear, please let me know. No, no, go go ahead. Okay, so that's a good question. Why do we do a one sample t-test and not a two sample t-test? Because we've got the control and the treatment. So it's a very good point and we'll get to that. There's two things we could do. We could do, okay, we've got the two samples. Let's, let's assume we've got just one gene. We're going to have four data points in the control, four data points in the treatment. We could do two sample t-test. Is the mean here equal to the mean here? Or we could compute the difference of these four and say, is the mean zero or the mean non-zero? This is two ways to look at the same problem, okay? And the key point is going to come when we're going to look at the assumptions of the t-test, okay? And I can tell you right away that taking the difference and doing a one simple t-test is what you should do, okay? And we'll see why. So now let's assume that we've taken the differences between the treatment and the control. And what you want to know is, are, uh, is the gene expression level, or is the... Um, mean of the log ratios across the four replicates equal to zero or not? Okay. 
So that's a pair t test. So this, uh, this is equivalent to doing, uh, to doing a pair t test. But you could just say, I summarize my data like that and I do one sample t test. But in fact, it's just like doing a pair t test. But a pair t test is you compute differences and you do one sample t test. So in fact, a pair t test is just a one sample t test on differences, on pair differences. You guys are good. Okay, so let's look at the example to try to understand how we compute the p-value. <coughs> so here, maybe we're gonna, look, we're gonna um, go over this. So here, I read the data, okay, take the log, same as before. Here we compute uh, the difference between the four HIV replicates minus uh, their paired uh, control replicates. Now I compute the t-test for the first gene. So there's a t.test function. I specify uh, the first gene. And here this is the, the, uh, the hypothesis is that the mean is zero. So mu is equal to zero. Okay. So let's try to do that in R. So here it's, I think it's quite important we do it. Okay, so this is it. So here, read the data, compute the difference, so the log ratios, and then we're going to do the t-test. Okay, so gene one will, co will contain the t-test of testing whether the mean is equal to zero or not. So we can also look at the output. So let's type that to see what it looks like. So it tells you this is a one sample t-test. The data was just the first row of the M matrix, which is just the first row of uh, differences between uh, uh, HIV and control and the log scale, which is just the first gene uh, of the log ratios. This is the t-statistic. This is the degrees of freedom, y3, because we've got four replicates. Remember that the formula is n minus 1, so 4 minus 1 is 3. This is the p-value. And the alternative hypothesis is that the true mean is not equal to 0. And this is the actual mean that's computed from the sample. So it, it gives you a little summary of, of uh, the test and all of the things. Shouldn't you first check the distribution Say that again. Yeah, so uh, we, we've, first of all, we've, we've gone through some of the assumptions when we looked at the, uh, the HIV data set. So it's right that here we have to assume that the data are from a normal distribution. So we'll talk a little bit about that after. We'll see that, in fact, the assumptions are not exactly correct. Maybe we're going to run into a few problems. Okay, so... <coughs> So this is the observed statistic is 0.74, right? Which we got from R, which is here. Um, if you go on the other side is minus 0.74. Now we want to know, so p-value by definition is what's the probability that we observe something as extreme or more extreme, okay? That is either something larger than what we observe or smaller than the negative value of that. And then you're going to compute the area under the curve. And that's very easy to do in R because you can compute the probability under the curve. Okay? And this is how that p-value is computed. So if we go back to the formula, that's why I've written uh, that the p-value can be computed as, as two times the probability that uh, t n minus 1 is greater than t in absolute value because Tn minus 1 greater than Tn absolute value only gives you that part. It's the probability that you observe statistic greater than that in absolute value. And then you need to multiply it by 2 because it's symmetric, so you're going to get the other part on that, on that side. Okay. Once again, this is just, um, it's more important that you know what the p-value means than the actual formula to compute it because R can do that for you. Any questions? Okay. Which in this means it's two-trace t-test, right? 
Yes. So here we are, we, the alternative says well, that we're looking at mu not equal to zero. We could say that we're only interested if uh, mu is strictly greater than zero, but because here we're looking at differentially expressed genes, we're looking at mu equals zero versus mu not equal to zero. On the other hand, if you were to look at a treatment where you can only believe that the expression could be greater when you apply the treatment, and you could do a one sample t-test, where the alternative, yeah, I mean, off, often you will do a two sample t-test, and that's why I did not even bother to talk about the one sample t-test. Um, okay. So this is another example, just using the gene number four, doing the exact same thing. And of course, because the expression is slightly different, you can see that the p-value that you get is very different. And in this case, the p-value is 0.04, which technically, if you were to do a test and you assume all the assumptions are correct, and if you use uh, 0.05 significance level, you would say that the gene is probably different gene expressed. Zero is zero. zero. Yes. So you need to know that. You need to know what you're testing. So mu zero is just some value that you believe might be true, and you want to test that hypothesis. And the, the y is the, the mean of these three. Uh, y bar will be the mean, the, the empirical mean of these four uh, observations. Okay. So y bar is just, so for those who've never seen the bar uh, above the y, it's just a uh, a way to denote the empirical mean, so the sample mean. If there's things that sometimes you've never seen, you don't understand, you don't know what it is, but you feel like maybe you're the only one, uh, don't be ashamed to raise your hand and ask it. Uh, sorry, I, I think I missed at the beginning of when we were describing the, the, the actual uh, experiment, but they are paired because they are the same, the, they are, or they originate from the same colony of cells and the same no, they are paired because this is, a, in a way, it's it's kind of a technical limitation of cDNA microarrays that you need to put the two samples on the same slide. Oh, this, this is, uh, those so they are coming color, from the same array. Yes. Microarrays. Okay. 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 So you should know the answer to that one already because I said it. But let's say. You know, I'm asking you the question, what is a p-value? So it's a measure of how much evidence we have against the, the alternative hypothesis. It's the probability of making an error. Uh, it's a name code used by statisticians. Uh, it's something that biology is one below 0.05. Uh, it's the probability of observing a value as extreme or more extreme by chance alone. Or it's all of the above. So which ones are true? Okay. Um, so, well, you know, we could argue that C is true and D is true. Uh, um, if we remove C and D, which ones do you think are true and are not true? So A is true. E is E is true. A is true. What about B? Okay, so how many of you think that B is true? You, you need to raise your hand. So raise your hand now if you don't want to raise it next. How many of you think that it's not true? Okay, so it's almost half and half. Depends. Uh, it depends. Oh, that's that's great. <laughs> depends on what? <laughs> no, um, it's 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 wrong. It's false. So p value has nothing to do with the probability of making an error. Okay, and we'll we'll see a little bit about that. But you could you could pick uh, p value is 0.05, but the probability of making an error is 50 percent. Okay, it's related to what we call the type one error. But there's other kinds of errors you can make. So we'll see that. OK, so two sample t-test. So the two sample t-test is very similar to the one sample t-test. Just the formula, you compute the t-statistics slightly different. 
And the assumptions are slightly different too. <clears throat> so let's assume that we've got the data yi1 to yin, and i is one or two this time, right? Because we've got the control and the treatment. So it's two sample. We have to assume that the data are independent, they're normally distributed, just like in the one sample t test. The first one is a mean mu i, so either mu1 or mu2, and we've got a variance sigma squared. In addition, we need to assume that the data in the two groups are independent and that the variance is the same in the two groups. Okay? So right away you can see that the independent uh, assumption, if we were to do a two sample t test in this case, could definitely be questioned, right? Because they are on the same array. So let's imagine that uh, something goes wrong on one of the microarrays. Then they're definitely not independent because if one of the, the measurement is bad, the other is very likely to be bad, right? So this time we have um, a, a two sample hypothesis. So mu1 is equal to mu2. So the expression level of gene, uh, expression level of that gene in uh, the first condition is equal to the expression level in the second condition versus uh, they, are, they are different. <clears throat> so the formula is slightly more complicated, but it's, the, it's basically the same thing. So this time what you're going to do is that you're going to look at the difference between the two empirical means in the two uh, sample treatment and control. The idea is that if this is big, it means that there is probably a difference between the two, that uh, the gene is differentially expressed. And if it's small, it probably means that there is no much of difference and therefore the gene is not differentially expressed. However, we still want to uh, penalize for the variability, okay? And because we assume that the variance is constant, this is the way we're going to uh, pull the standard error across the two samples when we compute the standard error. So this is exactly the same idea difference between uh, uh, the two sample and we penalize by large variances. If the means are equal, t follows the t distribution with n1 plus n2 minus 2 degrees of freedom. So again, you can see it's very similar in terms of the formula. Before we had n minus 1. This time, because we have uh, two samples, we get n1 plus n2 observation. But because we've, we estimate two parameters, uh, um, uh, the two variances, s1, s2, we have two degrees of freedom. Once again, don't worry too much about the formula because we R can do that for you. The, the way you compute the p value is exactly the same. So as far as you know, the overall presentation and interpretation of the results is concerned, it's exactly the same thing. You can do, you can compute the t statistics. So this is the uh, the formula that you do, that you use to compute the the two sample uh, t statistic, and then um, this is what you would get. So there's just one difference here is that when you compute the test statistic using t dot test is that you need to input uh, two samples because it's a two sample t-test. So here we will input data from one to four for the HIV condition and then data from five to eight from the control condition. And this is still looking at G1. And in theory, you need to assume that the variants are equal. There's a way that you can sort of relax that assumption, but if you do that, then uh, some of the things uh, are not exactly correct when you compute the t-statistic. And by default, R is, um, by default is, do not assume they are equal, so R will do the correction for you. But here I wanted to show you first when they are equal, so I force it to uh, assume that the variances are equal. Um, usually you would not worry about that, you will just use the default value, that would probably be um, good enough. So this is the result of the two sample t-test. This is the t statistic. This is the degrees of freedom, 4 plus 4 minus 2, 6. This is the p value. Uh, and then it gives you also the sample mean in x and the sample mean in y. Again, the p value is computed exactly the same way. And you can see this time that p value is 0.5. So again, we would not reject the null hypothesis. So in fact, even though we use, first we use a one sample t test, here we use a two sample t test, doesn't make a very big difference in terms of uh, the null hypothesis. But if we look at gene four, um, we can do the same thing again. And you can see that here the p-value is slightly different, but it's just right below the threshold of 0.05. OK? 
okay? And you can do it exactly the same way. So everything's the same, it's just the way you specify the t-test, you've got the two samples, and here I specify the assumption because I wanted to uh, uh, show you when the, the variance are equal. So the true t-test needs the variances to be equal in the two groups. Yes? Uh, so you, this, this script is just for one gene, right? Yes. How can you do it for all the genes without having to type it one by one? Uh, you can't. You have to do it one by one. <laughs> no, uh, we'll see that. So you could do the L apply function, for example. Okay. You know, that the apply function with the mean and the star division we've seen before. Okay. You could do that and just apply oh, the t-test to that. Uh, or you can do a loop, and we'll just do a loop for now. But we'll, we'll go over it. Okay, so let's go over the assumptions because I think that, that is pretty important. So the data need to be normal. If not, then one can use a transformation or a non-parametric test. So this is kind of like an alternative to the t-test that is non-parametric. Um, if the sample size is large enough, and typically large enough means n is greater than 30, then the t-test works just fine. It's because uh, there's some uh, limit results in statistics that says when the sample size is large enough, the sample mean um, the sample mean, mean will be approximately normal, and therefore the t-test remains valid. It will be approximately uh, uh, normal, and therefore it works just fine. So this is great because this is all theory, but in practice, especially when you work uh, in, in bioinformatics and biology, you never have n is greater than 30, right? It's very rare that you have n is greater than 30. So basically, all of these nice rules and things about the t-test are just not valid in our case. So we need to be very careful about that. Um, independence, so usually it's satisfied because, you know, if, 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 um, if you're looking at uh, replicates, especially biological replicates, typically they will be independent, so we don't have to worry too much about the independence between replicates. Um, if not, then you really need more complex modeling, and you're sort of in trouble because it, it gets very complicated. So, by transformation, you get what, what the, the normalization? Oh, so we remember when we're looking at the histograms and the box plots before taking the log, it was highly skewed. It was definitely not normal, right? It was not symmetric at all. At all. So, it was really bad. So, taking a transformation can help you to make the data more normal. And this okay. is something very common in statistics, is that when there are some assumptions, typically people might just, so you have two options. There are some assumptions, they're not satisfied. What do you do? You try to find another test or another method that do not require the same assumptions, okay? Such as a non-parametric test where there's very little assumptions. Or you try to transform your data, okay? So you can normalize, you could take the log transformation, you try to transform them so that the, the assumptions are more valid, or are close to being valid. But for example, for a bimodal distribution, you can not transform to a... No, so there are things that you couldn't really do. So, okay. so the independence between the two groups, so this is what we've discussed. Uh, in the two sample t-test, the groups need to be independent. If not, then one can use a pair t-test, which is what we've done here, right? If, there's a, if the two groups are not independent, that is, there's a natural pairing between the two, then you can do a pair t-test. And in fact, this is what you should do with cDNA microarrays. And remember, for the two sample t-tests, I said that we have to assume that the variances are the same. Otherwise, it's not valid. But in fact, there's uh, another variant of the t-test, which is called the uh, Welch's t-test which is in fact the default in R when you do two sample t-tests, which will correct and do uh, a t-test with separate variances from the two groups. <coughs> so the variances have to be exactly equal. Yes, you need to assume that, they, well. I mean, you can test it by summarizing your data, right? Yeah, but the sample variances will never be equal, right? Yes because there's variability in the data. So, yeah. it, you know, if you, uh, I don't know, if you go tomorrow and measure something and you come the next day, you know, you will probably get a different answer because there is variability. 
Um, so it's very, it, it's difficult to know if the variances are, are different or not. I mean, you can look at the numbers and get a feel if they are very different or not. Especially here that we've got so many genes, so we can look at, uh, you know, the variance in the first group and the second group for all genes and try to test that assumption. Typically, it's not that bad, but in fact, you don't lose much if you relax that assumption and use uh, Welsh's t-test. So typically, and that's why it's the default in R, it's because it's more flexible and you don't really pay a price for it. It still works fairly well. So this is something I will let you practice on your own. It's very easy. It's the exact same command, except that you remove the var that equal equal true. So you just use the default two sample t-test, and you can compute the p-value in exactly the same way. But okay? In, in, if you have just four samples on each R, you cannot assume that it's normal distribution, right? No, I mean, if, if you know the, the truth is that there's nothing in real life that's normal. Because a normal, you know, it's a distribution that we have, it's nice and convenient. But in reality, you know, the, the, there's nothing that's exactly normal, right? Because so, it's the real world. Yeah, so it's okay to, to, do, uh, to assume normal, normal t, no, to, to assume it if you have 30 samples, because that way that the, the, the distribution of the means of the samples are going to be obviously a normal distribution. But if you have just four samples, then you're, you're in trouble. What you can do is that you can sort of look at, at your data, trying to make sure that there's no uh, gross uh, violation of the assumptions. But obviously with four observations, it's very difficult. And you, you know what? With four observations, you, if I give you just one gene with four observations here, four observations here, and I tell you, uh, give me the difference between the two, uh, tell me if it's different to express, and I'll probably tell you, you know, see you later, you know, I can't do anything. Gene expression experiments are different because, yes, we will only have four uh, measurements in the control and in the treatment, but we've got thousands of genes. So in a way, you've got some information coming from the other genes. So maybe you can borrow some information from the others in trying to make a decision. If, if you have a distribution of across all the genes in one sample, that's normal. You no, you can't do that. No, that's why so, uh, what information from the other genes can you get? You'll see. So we'll, we'll get to that a little bit. <coughs> One question. By the variance, uh, assuming that have to be more or less or, or identical, how do we know that? With these box plots or...? Well, so one thing you could do, for example, okay, why don't you tell me what you would do? I think, I think the box plots, to, to plot the two columns in this case, and each column in a box plot, and see the... That would be okay, except that the box plot, what we're looking at is doing a box plot per array, right? So we were looking at the variability across genes. Oh, Here, yeah. we want to know if the variance in the, the four replicates of that gene oh, and uh, in the treatment and control are the same. Uh, okay. But what you could do, for example, is compute the variance for each gene. You can compute the variance from the four replicates in the control and in the treatment. And then you can do a scatter plot of the variances in control in treatment for all gene. What you would like to see is maybe some kind of a line that says that you know they are roughly similar across. Uh, but it's very difficult to do because uh, variance estimates can be very noisy, in particular with four replicates. So it's it's you know it's hard. I mean, it will be very difficult for you to have something that says, oh yeah, they're exactly the same. So that's why you know if you have any doubt, just use. The, the default in R and it will take care of that for you. And that's the best way you can do. And in fact, it doesn't hurt you very much. If, even if they were equal and you said they're not, it's not going to change very much. So I will let you do uh, the Welsh's T test and the pair T test and you can compare to the previous results. And in fact, what you should observe is that when you do the pair T test, it's exactly the, uh, the same as doing a regular one sample t-test on the differences as we've done. It's just that it's nice because it's doing the differences and everything for you, you don't have to handle that. Okay, so what are uh, non-parametric tests? We did not really talk about it. So it's just a way to do um, a t-test with with no assumptions on the distribution of the samples. So you would say, well, this is great. You know, why don't we always do a non-parametric test, right? Because we don't make any assumption. I don't even know why people would bother with the t-test. 
Um, that's true, you know, it's very robust and you don't have to care too much uh, about the assumptions of distribution of your statistics. However, there are some drawbacks to uh, using non-parametric uh, uh, alternatives. Obviously, they are very flexible, but in a way they are going to be uh, not, they're not going to be as powerful as doing a regular t-test if the data are normal. So if the data are normally distributed and you do a t-test, typically your power, that is the ability to detect true differences, will be much greater than if you use a non-parametric test. So you're going to lose some if you use a non-parametric test. So in a way, using a non-parametric te parametric test, you will be slightly more conservative. You'll be like, I'm okay if I don't detect everything, but I just want to make sure I don't make a mistake. So it's a trade-off between the two. Again, these sort of things are coded in R and you can do it very easily. So this is an exercise for you to do. Uh, use R to perform a non-parametric test. So for example, the Wilkinson uh, on Gene 1. So you don't know what you're looking for. Um, so what you could do, and I think that's, let's see if it is uh, in the script. Yeah, it's right here. So if you don't know what you're looking for, you can just do help that search. I made a typo in. Yeah. Well, that's good. I found it. So you can see that here. Get these. The, distribution and here you get the test. So what we want is Wilcox that test. Okay? So it's very similar to the T uh, the T test, the regular T test, and you use it uh, very much in the same way. Here we're gonna do two sample T tests and we just do it like that. Fortune one and you can look at the summary. Okay? Say that again? Uh, it's just the way that they, they compute the statistics. They are different. Very much like the, uh, uh, the t-test with an equal variance and the t-test with equal variance. The assumptions will, will typically be slightly different. I can't remember exactly what the assumptions of each, te each uh, test are, but I would say that uh, in most cases you will do with function. Uh, where do you see that? Uh, just Wilcoxing rank sum versus Wilcoxing side rank tests. Um, I mean, I always see both in every program I use, and I never know. What it's just the way they compute the statistic. Uh, again, I think some of the assumptions might be slightly different right, in right. in either way. Uh, to be honest, I typically just do a, a t test. Uh, you know, if I want to do a, a statistical yeah. test. But I think. Um, when you when you don't really know exactly, um, you know you've got several options. You you might think that the default in R are typically what would be uh, the best for most users. So if you just use a default, typically you're, you're doing the right choice. I always thought that the Man Whitney was different by the fact that they're assuming that the data are not independent. It 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 could, it could well be. Yeah, I don't remember exactly. That's, that's very possible, yeah. This is, so this is what I told you earlier when I said, you know, don't remember too much about the formulas and everything. The truth is that you cannot remember everything and especially the, the assumptions and so forth, okay? What you need to know is there are some assumptions, there are some tests, and you can go back to your notes, you can go back to your book, and you will know and you will be able to understand what it means, uh, such assumptions, how you can verify some of these, and that there exist uh, alternative methods to do a statistical test depending on what the assumptions are. <clears throat> okay, so we've got uh, three more minutes for about 30 slides, so I think we're good. Um, what we want to do next is basically to do the same kinds of uh, the same kind of test for each gene because the overall goal here is to test the hypothesis that the genes are differentially expressed, but you want to do that for all the genes, right? So it's very simple. What we're going to do um, is to apply. 
Okay, I'm talking about something else. I should go back to the slides, I guess. Okay, I wanted to talk first about the permutation test. When computing the p-value, all we need to know is the distribution of, of our statistics under the norm, right? Because what we want to know is what is the probability that we observe something as extreme or more extreme than the, the uh, statistics were observed under the null distribution. So assuming that there is no difference, assuming that the gene is not differentially expressed, what are the chances that I would have observed something as extreme or more extreme than what I have observed? So what we need to do is to be able to, if you want, um, simulate some data sets where we know that the null distribution is true, we compute a bunch of statistics, and then we compare it to the one we observed, and we find something that's you know, more extreme than what we have, we might think that, yeah, potentially it's not differentially expressed. If, if uh, the number of statistics we observe that are greater than the one we have is very small, then we might think that probably there was a difference um, because our p-value is very small, or, it, or the, statistics were, the statistics was very extreme. So the question is, how can we estimate uh, things under the null distribution? So in the two sample case, it's fairly easy to do that. How many permutations should we put into the, it depends on... That's a good question. I would say typically, you know, 100, uh, 100 to 1,000 permutations is probably uh, enough. It depends on the number of samples you have? Exactly, right? Because here you've got four and four. You don't have that many permutations you can do, right? Yeah. So very quickly you're going to see so that you've done you all your permutations. You increase the number of permutations, so you get yes. more power to... Exactly, you get more accurate p-values. Yes, okay. Exactly. So that's an alternative of the DTS to analyze poor size data, right? Exactly. And in fact, this is something that people do a lot for microarrays. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. This is something they do in the SAM R... Uh, package and we'll see that it's actually kind of a nice way to do it okay so here are some a couple of facts about the permutation test so you can select the statistics you prefer so it could be the mean difference so here you could just compute the mean difference you could compute a t statistic it's not parametric and does not really depend on the statistic you you actually choose um, what you do is that you compute the statistics for the original data, you do a number of permutations. Every time you have an, uh, a new data set, you recompute uh, that uh, statistic, and then the p value will just be how many times do you, in, how many times in all of the data sets you generated, you observe something that's more extreme as, or as extreme to the one you calculated from the original data set. So it will be the proportion of newly computed statistics that are as extreme or more extreme than the one you, you uh, had originally. So this is an example in R on how to do the uh, permutation test. Uh, what I encourage you to do is to go over this code, make sure you understand it. If tomorrow morning you feel like you have no idea what this is doing, we can discuss it.